Today, we'll build our procedural animation character rig and set up the constraints for environment interactions. Then we'll dive into the first steps of programming our environment interaction state machine. My name is Nikki. Welcome to iHeart Game Dev. Let's get started. The animation rigging package provides a list of roughly a dozen different constraint components that can be applied on a rig. We can combine multiple constraints on each rig in order to get the procedural animation that we are looking for. If you're wondering what a rig even is, be sure to check out my videos covering the subject. But over the next roughly 10 minutes, we'll set up our character and project with the rig constraints needed for procedural environment interactions. In our project, we have a game object titled Rig1. Attached is a rig component. Start by renaming the rig to Environment Interaction Rig. For environment interactions, we want to take control of our character's left and right arms and hands. To accomplish this, we are going to use the two bone IK constraint. Create two new children, left arm and right arm. Then attach a two bone IK constraint component to each. IK stands for inverse kinematics, which essentially means that joints are positioned and rotated based on a target position. To set up the two bone IK, we only need to set the tip property. Lock the inspector, then press on our character's hand bone in the scene view to highlight it in the hierarchy. Drag the hand bone game object to the empty tip property and find the small drop down menu. When we select the auto setup from tip transform, every property will automatically be assigned. The left hand bone remains set as the tip property while the mid and root properties are assigned to the left forearm bone and the left arm bone. But now we also have source object properties. Look at our left arm game object in the hierarchy. There are two new children, left arm target and left arm hint. These are set as the source objects. The target is the point where the tip, or in our case, the hand is going to try to move. And the hint is used to specify the direction the limb should be oriented when it bends. It's worth noting that this automatic setup works as expected with traditional bone layouts, like Banana Man's. One bone for the upper arm, one bone for the forearm, and one for the hand. If it didn't work, you could try setting this up yourself manually. Before we preview the procedural animation, we're going to want to visualize these two source game objects. To do so, select each and in the bottom right of the scene view, press the plus icon to select a mesh. This transparent mesh is only visible in the scene view, but makes working with the source objects so much easier. Repeat the same steps for the right arm game object to set it up for procedural animation. Once complete, we can now activate the procedural animation override by doing one of two things, entering preview mode in the animation window, or entering play mode. Now we can see that as the rest of the character's body is controlled by its keyframed animations, the hands and arms are being overridden, trying to procedurally place the hands where the target is positioned. As we move the target around, the hand will follow. For the environment interaction rig, we're going to set default positions. We'll want the hint game objects to be placed at about waist level behind the respective arms. This will give the forearm and arm bones the most realistic rotation as the hand repositions itself. As for the default hand positions, we'll place them at about the same level in front of the character. Now as we increase and decrease the weight of the rig, we can see the procedural animation from the two-bone IK constraint overriding the character. However, if we go through the trouble of programming the movement for the target, we wouldn't get the desired results in the character's current state. Notice how the hand position is pointed fingertips forward. When touching a surface, our hands are naturally palm forward. How can we rotate the character's hands in addition to the repositioning from the two bone IK? The solution is to add more constraints to our rig. The multi-rotation constraint rotates an object to match the rotation of its source objects. Start by resetting the left arm and right arm target's rotation to zero. 
add a multi-rotation constraint to the left arm and right arm game objects. For each, set the hand as the constrained object and keep all three axes checked. Then, use the target game object of the 2 mode IK as the source object for the multi-rotation. Remember to do the same thing on the opposite side. There is a good chance that by default the hand is not rotated in the direction that we're hoping for. To ensure that we get the procedural animation results we want, we need to update the offset setting. In the case of Banana Man, the left palm aligns with the Z4 direction when rotated 90 degrees on the Y axis. And to align the right hand, it needs to be rotated minus 90 degrees on the Y axis. This offset value is for Banana Man, and there is a chance that other characters require different offsets. Just be sure to align the palm of the hand with the Z axis of the respective target. Then rotate these left and right targets so that the Z axis is pointed in the forward direction of the character. Basically, the palm and the target should both be pointed forward. With those set, the hand will rotate to match the rotation of the source game object. Now in play mode, as we update the weight of the rotation constraint, the hand will fluctuate between the override from the two bone IK and the override of the multi rotation constraint. With the weight at 100%, as we rotate the target, the hand will rotate as well. Once we have our character set, that completes our rig for procedural animation. The left and right arms will now follow as we move around the targets, and the hand will rotate to match the target rotation. We are now finally ready to program the procedural animation. Hey, if you've been enjoying this video and want to help the channel grow, consider liking and subscribing, and I hope you enjoy the rest. In our scripts folder of the asset window, we'll see our state machine folder that contains the state manager and base state scripts. If you want to learn about the implementation of these two scripts, check out the previous video in this series, Programming a Better State Machine. Create a new folder in the scripts folder titled Environment Interactions. We'll add eight new scripts in order to implement our Environment Interaction State Machine. Those are named as followed. Environment Interaction State Machine. Environment Interaction Context. Environment Interaction State. Approach State. Touch State. Search state, rise state, and reset state. Open the environment interaction state machine. The environment interaction state machine class will derive from the state manager class set up earlier. What this means is that the environment interaction state machine inherits the definition set up in the state manager abstract class, which actually includes the mono behavior methods. Notice that state manager requires the generic eState enum type. We can finally implement the enum type that both our state manager and base state expect. Inside the environment interaction state machine class, we'll declare an enum, e environment interaction state. Then we'll list out each of our planned states that will be a part of this state machine search, approach, rise, touch, and reset. The E that precedes environment interaction state is standard naming conventions for enums. What this now allows us to do is pass environment interaction state machine dot E environment interaction state as the state manager's generic type. Based on the implementations of our state manager and base state, current state and the state's dictionary can only consist of classes that derive from base state that use this enum type. And the state keys of each state can now only be set to one of these five enum values. Otherwise, Unity will throw an error. Next, let's provide access to all of the components of our character. To do so, add the animation rigging namespace at the top of the file. Now, we have access to types related to animation rigging. Declare serialized fields for our constraint components. Left IK constraint and right IK constraint will both be private and of type two bone IK constraint and left multi-rotation constraint and right multi-rotation constraint will also be private of type multi-rotation constraint. For environment interactions, we will need access to the character's speed and collider. For this project, Banana Man moves using a rigid body and capsule collider. Create two final serialized fields, rigid body of type rigid body and root collider of type capsule collider. Note, if you are using the character controller, that is totally okay. You'll replace any logic surrounding the rigid body and capsule collider with equivalent logic for a character controller. We're really only accessing the speed from the rigid body and the dimensions of the capsule collider, 
which should translate fairly well. But if you have any questions, leave them in the comments or jump into the channel Discord and this amazing community can definitely help debug. Back in the Unity editor, let's add the environment interaction state machine script to the environment interaction rig. Going forward, all of our logic will be impossible without these serialized fields being properly set in the inspector. In Unity, we can ensure that property values are set with what's known as an assertion. The assert class offers an array of methods that we can use to validate our code, checking conditions like whether a particular object is null, whether a value is within a certain range, or whether two objects are equal. If these conditions are not met during runtime, Unity will halt execution and display an error message, allowing us to quickly locate and fix any issues. We can access assertions through the namespace UnityEngine.Assertions. Let's create a new method titled validate constraints. We'll use asserts is not null method for each of the members variables we just defined. The second argument is the error message that will be thrown. So we can add helpful context explaining what went wrong. Now we just need to invoke our validate constraints method. We can do so in the awake method of the environment interaction state machine. We can test this validate constraints method by entering play mode. We'll see that the left bone IK validation currently throws an error, meaning it stops execution of the rest of the script. To fix all the validation errors, we just need to fill the references. Drag the left target and the right target into the appropriate slots. Unity will automatically extract the reference to the attached component. Do the same for the character's root game object to get the references for the rigid body and collider. Entering play mode and errors are gone. And just like that, our character now has its rig set up for environment interactions. All that's missing is a little bit of code. Next time, everything is about programming, as we flesh out the state machine with its context and state implementations. But what did you think of this episode? Did you enjoy learning about the character rig and constraints? And do you have any ideas for what we can do in the future with procedural animation? Leave a comment below letting me know. As always, thank you to the patrons and YouTube members for helping to keep the lights on and the continued support of this channel. If you would like access to my project files, including this episode, while supporting the channel, check out the iHeartGameDev Patreon. And if you'd like to support the channel directly here on YouTube, memberships are now available. And of course, a special shout out to Jupe, TarotDev, Peter Steiner, Ricky Thonglevong, and Rob Malko for the top tier support. Do you have any questions about this project or any of my other videos? I highly recommend joining the iHeartGameDev Discord channel, which is full of a ton of awesome developers just like yourself who are happy to help out. But that is all for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.